Welcome to TPGI's Real People, Real Stories podcast, where you'll find interesting and diverse stories from folks working to make the world a more inclusive place. Hey, welcome to the Real People, Real Stories podcast brought to you by Pete TPGI. I am your host, Mark Miller, thanking you for helping us keep it accessible. Do us a favor. If you're enjoying the Real People, Real Stories podcast, share it. Tell someone about it. Hey, even link to it from your accessible website. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for being here. I've got a, a super cool guest today that I'm particularly excited about because uh, he does something that, uh, that, I, that I really love. Um, our guest is Anthony Ferraro. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Anthony. And Anthony is a Paralympic judo champion, I guess is the most succinct way to say it. Um, and uh, we were talking a little bit before the show, Anthony, uh, you know, and I have a, a pretty extensive martial arts background. So being on the on the on a call with a judo champion is just like, uh, this isn't even work for me. This is just nothing but fun. So can you start off by telling me how, like, how did you get interested in the martial arts and judo in the first place? Where did this kind of path start that led you to be a, a, a judo champion? And and please, you know, talk talk about the the particular challenges that you have as an individual that 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 maybe the rest of us don't. Absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me on the uh, podcast, Mark. And I need to stop you first uh, with the. I would not call myself a judo champion. Definitely a, a competitor. All right. I, I work as hard as I can, and uh, I've won the nationals a few times for judo. Uh, I'm on Team USA, training for the Paralympics, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I got into judo with, you know, I was a wrestler through high school. Uh, I did pretty well for myself. You know, I had a few championships and stuff, and my brother, my older brother decided actually to make, you know, I dealt with, I was born blind. So, you know, I was the only blind wrestler in my high school and, you know, in high school wrestling at the time. And there was an adaptive uh, rule where it was two hand start, two hand contact. Always you had to have constant contact when you were wrestling. And if you broke apart, the referee would blow the whistle and bring us back. So I kind of like, I, once I started doing well for myself, you know, I was terrible when I started and then I started training like super hard and, and just really getting, you know, pretty good at the sport. And once I started doing well, people started complaining about the two hand start. And, you know, I started running into this like adversity of people like saying I had an unfair advantage or even saying like I was faking my blindness to get this unfair advantage. And it was like crazy. But you know, my older brother, Oliver, he was a great wrestler and he saw like what I dealt with and was like really inspired by it and thought it was a great story to share. And he was into film. He was a big film uh, major and he did, you know, film producing like all independently and stuff. And he said, uh, you know, he made a, a two minute video about me talking about what it was like to be a blind wrestler dealing with adversity growing up, you know, different things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a two minute clip. And he said, this is my little brother. If you're a camera operator, film producer, whatever, I want to make a, a film about him, but I don't have all the resources. So please reach out. And, you know, this was after I won a championship my junior year of wrestling in high school. And then someone reached out to him saying, you know, this is amazing. Like, we need to sit down about this. And it was this guy, Chris Sikorsky, who's another independent producer. And he's produced a few films like, you know, by himself. And he, they decided to link up together and make a full feature link documentary in my senior year and, you know, follow me around and wow. what it was like, you know, dealing with all these things. And long story short, they, the trailer got posted on Kickstarter to raise money in 2015. And it got like millions of views by uh, like social media platforms and stuff. And one of those views, I'm sitting at home and, uh, you know, it's like 2015, 2017, actually at this point and I get a phone call and they're like hello and you know they're like is this Anthony Ferraro it's the United States Paralympic Committee I'm like sorry oh, I think oh, you cool. have the wrong number <laughs> and oh, cool. I, it was like insane you know and I just also they were like we saw your uh, film and we were wondering if you would consider training judo for the Paralympics you know the only disability in the Paralympic judo is a visual impairment and 
it's the closest thing to wrestling that's in the Paralympics right now. And we think he'd be a great fit. And like, I just jumped on it right away. And that's how I got into judo five years ago. So how do you feel? Uh, this all makes sense to me, right? As a, as a, a martial artist myself, having done um, a lot of the, uh, you know, some judo and, and jujitsu, you know, and, and also having a colleague of mine that was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, like I completely get that when you're blind, once you make um, contact, you're really using that tactile sensitivity. You know, you can, you can, you can feel and understand what your component, your opponent's doing to the point where I close my eyes a lot when I train to try and take away that visual bias that might be throwing me off. How do you feel like, how is the transition from um, wrestling like a, tr- a traditional collegiate type wrestling to judo for you? Is that a difficult transition or, or based on kind of the experience you had with wrestling, was it a natural sort of slide from one thing to the other? Right. Well, so I was really lucky because I also trained in Greco Roman and freestyle wrestling. Uh, so Greco Roman was a huge help in transitioning to judo, but the big difference is like, I call it wrestling with a jacket on, like, yes. with, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you have the whole, you know, uh, gi on and everything. And for those of you who don't know what a gi is, it's like the, the karate type outfit with the belt and everything. And it, it was like the main difference was learning the arm bars, chokes, and getting used to being comfortable on my back for periods of time. And, you know, those were the main, like, I remember the first day of practice, so I even had to learn how to, like, the first thing they taught you was to learn how to fall correctly. And I was like, mm-hmm oh man, I'm not used to this, you know, like real baby steps and then got into it. And it was just, I really fell in love with it. You know, I I almost bring a real, (laughs) some people hate it, but it's really good for competing because I'm more of a, for judo, I'm a competitor. For jujitsu, I do for like the love of the sport and it's really like a therapy. Um, And it also helps with judo, but judo, I bring like a wrestling aspect to judo. So it's like this, you know, it, judo there's you see guys out there they're very zen and stuff and they'll just throw you i'm like a bull like constantly going and like keep that wrestling mindset in judo and i think it really helps because i have such a disadvantage of you know not the amount of years as all these other people that i kind of have to play catch up like my coach and i joke that i've you know put like 12 years of judo into like four years that's funny well i and i think it also can help too, just in the fact that you're throwing something different at these more experienced judo players than what they're used to, right? You know, if you're, if you were playing closer to their game, then, then their experience would definitely be able to rise above you. But when you're kind of coming at it from a little bit different of an angle, you're, you're causing them, you're challenging them too, right? You're causing them to deal with something a little bit. No, different. exactly. Cause yeah. they're used to like a slick, you know, if I try to be a judoka against judo people, I, I get, I, it's yeah. not even fair, you know, I have to do what I can and be aggressive and like more physical. Yeah, the gi is an interesting, um, an interesting thing that you bring up, because I think that uh, a lot of people struggle with that. Um, and I, I don't know how you feel about it now. But you know, I think the gi in jujitsu, especially but um, uh, sort of slows the game down a little bit, right? When you're, when you're all slick and shirtless, and you have a um, singlet on and wrestling, it's very fast, you know, but when you have a gi on it kind of, it kind of slows things down a little bit, but it's very, very different. And I can remember um, a scene in one of these like uh, shows on TV where Gary Busey grabbed Ronda Rousey. It was one of these uh, uh, reality kind of shows and they were by a swimming pool and they were doing some challenge or something. And Ronda Rousey just had a jacket on like a windbreaker on. And she did that judo move where you duck your head down and and flip your hands over and kind of roll your shoulders so that her windbreaker just came right off. Right. Which when you, when you get in trouble in judo and somebody's got a hold of your gi, you, you pop your way right out of it. And I'm like, what, what are you doing Gary Busey grabbing Ronda Rossi and trying to throw her in a pool? Right. She's exactly, (laughs) that's the wrong person to do that with. But, um, (laughs) but it just showed her, um, understanding of the gi and the other thing that i think is interesting about that that i think must be an advantage for you is that that is all tactile right that's not a visual thing that Rhonda saw that she felt what was happening to her and reacted and i wonder if you think that you do in some ways have an advantage because you're not even distracted by that element of sight you're you're you can you can 
commit yourself so wholly to that to that tactile sensitivity and feeling what your opponent is is doing absolutely i think it's uh i wouldn't call it so much as an advantage as more of like balances out the playing field in that sense like it's like that's your eyes you know and Mm -hmm. you know because being able to see some things definitely would help like in a perfect world you know that would that would be great but being able to feel like when I was in wrestling my coach worked with me so much to where I was able to feel if the person was like tensing up their muscles to change their level so I would get ready for things like that and like with judo it's like you know I, I rely so much on my grip strength anyway that it's really helpful and I really like being able to grab onto the gi and you know it definitely can slow it down but there's ways if you want to to keep it going fast you know you can really throw people off so I just I like it it's like a game of chess too sometimes you have to wait sometimes you have to it's like you know it's very strategic especially jujitsu so are you is is jujitsu kind of a new passion for you do you think you'll you'll start moving and and do me a favor um when you answer this question also just explain to the listeners the difference between judo and jujitsu you and I uh, know it really well, but uh, not everybody out there understands the difference. But I'm curious, is, do you think that you kind of have a future with jiu-jitsu as well, or is that just uh, something you're going to continue to do for the love of it? Uh, you know, it's funny. I have thought about see where it takes me. I'm definitely training uh, towards the 2024 Paralympics in Paris. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be my next focus for the next what, two and a half years. Uh, and that's but- that's judo and I definitely want to continue jujitsu and and I think it's something I'll probably take seriously like take you know to the next level as much as I can after the Olympics in Paris and you know see if I can make something happen but continue training just I love it so much it's like a I walk out of jujitsu like judo it's a lot of mental stuff and pressure because it's all the Olympic and you know super competitive all that stuff Right. jiu-jitsu I walk out feeling like it was a therapy like I feel like I just went to yoga you know like it's yeah yeah I, I feel refreshed and I can like almost stay in a gym jiu-jitsu like all day and and just have a good time yeah uh judo you know you're getting slammed it's it's a it's hard on the body so the difference between judo and jiu-jitsu the main difference is like judo's um it's a lot more on your feet so it's there's a lot more throws so if you throw someone from their feet to their back cleanly it's called an epon which is a full point and the match is over and in judo you can also pin someone but and there's chokes and arm bars as well in jujitsu there's a lot on the mat so it's a you know it's a longer slower game like in judo if nothing happens in 10 seconds when you're on the ground they'll pull you back up basically in jujitsu you can hang on the mat and wait and make something happen like on the ground and it's way more methodical in my opinion and it it can be a lot slower i mean they're they're both to me very much like a chess match you know and and people looking at it from the outside might really see the physical aspects of it that you're talking about but i agree with you that both are like a chess match and jujitsu is just a really long chess match yeah (laughs) and um it, it, where you're on the ground like the idea is to get to the ground or or can be to get to the ground but once you get there it's just another place that you're you're competing right and then and and that doesn't end until a submission or it depends on the rules right there's, there's points there as well mm-hmm. um but it just goes and goes and goes and i agree with you like i've never um, i've done mild competing in jiu-jitsu um but mostly it's something i showed up to several times a week to uh to feel good mm-hmm. you know just absolutely just good. i think so that therapy is i completely feel you there i think uh physical activity like exercise and in any form is the biggest uh antidepressant prescription you could possibly get I completely agree with you i i also think that uh getting on the mat with you and having you throw me around and and lock me up a little bit would be great therapy <laughs> for me <laughs> oh man people That'd be good you know, that, that I'm sure you feel this way, but, you know, anytime you have the chance to work with somebody that's really good, that is better than you, it's almost like a privilege, right? You know? Oh, and, that's, um, I, I remember in high school, like high school to this day now, I constantly search for the people that would beat me up. 
so I can just, because if you're not losing, you're not learning, right? And you can't constantly find the person that you can bully around, you know? And you, you shouldn't, that's not the nature of the sport. You know, if there's someone that's lower than you in belt or not as good as you, whatever, you know, mm. it's your job to help teach them while you roll around with them. Yeah. Yeah, I could tell right away when when you made your comments on my opening statement of you being a champion that you had that humility that really comes with somebody who's deeply committed to the martial arts. And, and I think the way that you just phrased that is a lot about it. You're there to help people that aren't as good as you. And you're there to seek out people better than you because that's how you grow and learn. Right, because I, I never would have gotten to where I am in anywhere if it wasn't for other people. You can't do anything alone. And it's like, it's our job to give back as much as we can and, and to continue to take from the people that can give to us and then continue to give that. It's like, a yeah, it's like, it's like a passing cycle. down. This was given to me. I, this was privileged, uh, privileged enough to have this given to me. And now I'm going to share it with you. Exactly. You know? Like, check out this awesome trick I learned. Yeah. I'm not going to keep this from you. Well, it's it, like I'll, also, I'll do it to you a couple of times and then I'll show you what I'm doing. Yeah. And then and then when those people get better there, now you're you're learning from them. So I have exactly. a, a, a weird question for you from the perspective of somebody who is sighted that's that does very similar training to what you what you do. And in thinking about kind of your your total focus on the tactile aspect of it. Right do you, when you are sort of passing along your advice or you're helping out um, somebody you're training with, a partner that's sighted, is there insight that you can give them as, as a person who's blind and does really rely on that tactileness um, that they may not really discover themselves or that's a real revelation to them because, because they're sighted? Like, is there anything that you've said to them and they've gone, man, I never would have, I never would have thought of that or I don't, I can't feel it that way. Or, you know, is it, do you, is there a difference there? I don't know. I, I wouldn't say I'm some like, uh, I have like, you know, crazy, crazy things or anything, but like, I think in some ways, like sometimes I make people think differently with like where to put the pressure, or, like this mm -hmm. isn't feeling right. But, you know, I learned so much from everyone else too. Like I'll, I'll roll around with white belts and be like, yo, show me how you did that. Like, that was perfect. You know, yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. it's just people think it's, you know, you can only learn from someone above you, but you can learn from so many people. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, and, you know, when, when those white belts show up and you, you know, they go, Oh, you got stuck with me, you know? And I say, no, 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 you don't understand. I know you feel like you're learning a lot from me, but you don't get how much I'm learning from you, you know, mm -hmm. through having to explain to you what I know, like just that process of having to take what I know and explain it in a way that you understand helps me understand it better. And then seeing maybe the ways that you struggle or the ways that you handle something differently, you know, like you said, they, you know, sometimes just in their innocence, they come up with something new and you go, wait a minute, what did you just do? That's really cool. Yeah. Exactly. Or you see them struggle in a certain way and you think, oh, I never thought somebody would have a difficulty with it that way. And then you have to like figure out how to help them. And it just expands your, your understanding every time you do that. I completely agree. Yeah. And the cool thing about jujitsu is like, uh, and like, I'd, I'd say all martial arts, you know, it, it teaches you how to stop and think like, how do I get out of this situation or how do I make this situation better? And it's like, mm -hmm. it translates to life, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a fantastic point. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I, when I think about the jujitsu and being in a difficult situation and learning how to mitigate that situation, right? Like I may not be able to get out of this right now, but I, I could do something to not make it worse. And mm -hmm. I can stay here for a while until I find that little chink in the armor I need to make it better, you know? And exactly. You're right, man. That's just that's just life. You know, it's a little metaphor. You're getting on the mat every day and doing this little metaphor for life. Yeah. So, um, I think it's, uh, you know, when I, when I think about you and I, like I said, I actually have a friend who's, uh, what's your, what's your rank by the way, Anthony in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Um, blue belt. You're a blue belt. Okay. So this friend of mine who's competitive um, is a totally blind uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. I, I hope the two of you meet someday because I'm sure. Oh, that. that's incredible. Yeah, his name's Larry Lewis, and he's just, he's inspiration just to begin with as a human being. But uh, Where is he from? 
He where is he from? Do you know? He's out in the he's out in the Midwest. I can't oh, nice. exactly where he lives now. But uh, why? What area are you in? I'm in Jersey, but I I travel a lot. Yeah, yeah. He's. I mean, I can I can I can actually pass your name over to him if you want. Um, yeah, please. Uh, I always I'll look him up too. Yeah, he, he's always uh, interested in in um, getting together with people when they're in town, and he'll he'll seek out dojos and stuff, which I think is the wonderful thing about this community. I'm sure you do the same thing when you're traveling. You look for places to go train because absolutely, and that everyone open you know welcomes you with open arms it's a family worldwide so it's yeah. great that's the other amazing thing about it yeah so you must get to travel quite a bit then uh yeah so you know besides the judo it's all self-funded olympic journeys and stuff unfortunately it's uh it's rely on like sponsorships and things like that but uh my fiance and i we she works in tech so we can she can work from wherever so mm -hmm. when i have tournaments in other countries like i've been to tons of countries for judo you know competing and stuff uh we travel there and then after my tournament we'll go and travel around for a week or so and you know learn about the country that you know the people and just like help as much as we can do things and you know when covid hit it was like this pandemic that stopped everything you don't have a schedule like everything stopped and no traveling what's going to happen so we kind of, you know, aside from martial arts, I'm also a musician. I play guitar and sing. And we like, it was, people were arguing, you know, the election was coming up and, and people were just being negative online, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of tired of it. And I wanted to, I was playing at bars and restaurants and stuff, you know, making a decent amount of money. And I was just like, I, I know this is good, but I want more, like, I want to be able to, like, help any way I can in this time, or, like, leave a mark any way I can, and, and like, just promote some kind of positive thing, so we decided to come up with a 10,000 mile, seven week cross country music tour that we literally just planned completely by ourselves, funded by ourselves, and we just, she drove the 10,000 miles, and we went all around the country, like, from Jersey to California and back, like, been set up in all these beautiful places uh you know across everywhere with like beautiful scenery backdrops and stuff like in the redwoods in california on uh the grand canyon arizona and we called it we branded the whole thing and called it anthony ferraro's uh blind busking live stream tour and it was just you know this incredible experience like i uh, just we love traveling both of us have like a huge passion for traveling and you know helping others so it's like our way to give back and like make people smile so it's just a great thing that happened i think everybody <laughs> had to get creative last year you know and i, I know for me i haven't been on the mat um uh, doing jiu-jitsu you know brazilian jiu-jitsu since the pandemic started i still haven't gotten back on the mat because the the uh, yeah. place i was training um ended up having to shut down so um i've got to find a new home myself did you I mean, you, you really came up with a very interesting way to manage the pandemic and this travel. Were you, was it difficult for you to keep up with your training as well there in the pandemic? Yeah, so there was no training for like basically a year, I'd say, yeah. you know, and did nothing and it kind of got to me. I, I work out like, you know, pretty regularly where I have like a little like set up with, I have a bar and like some kettlebells and uh dumbbells and stuff and it's in my back spot of my apartment like outside so I do that like out there do a lot of body weight stuff and mm -hmm. you know I was keeping up with that but things I got exactly an email what like, I did, dude. <laughs> oh sorry what was that I said that's exactly what I do like no more yeah, going exactly. to the gym no more on the mat it's all kettlebells and whatever you can do you have to be in your own backyard though. people want to you can't just use the clothes as an excuse you know like right. you still got to just stay in shape for your, yeah. yourself yeah. and I did that and you know and then I got an email like a few months ago that we had a tournament in Azerbaijan in like a couple months and started training back up and things opened back up in Jersey and started training here and started training really hard getting really good and then you know a couple weeks ago maybe a month or so ago and it was like a couple weeks before my tournament I actually pulled my groin like really bad to where in practice I was throwing someone and I was doing so well too it was like one of the best nights I ever looked leading up to it and 
I like threw someone and my groin, I heard the loudest pop. And I, oh. just, I was like, uh, basically so disoriented after that. I was like, didn't know where I was for a second. And it was just really scary. And, you know, I couldn't, I could hardly walk for like the first couple of days. Like I couldn't do anything. And, you know, still to this day, it's like, it, anytime my groin flexes, it's like a little, like, it kind of you can feel it in there yeah that yeah. i can't grapple yet and it's pretty frustrating but that's that's staying positive that break yeah. you know what i mean like not training for a while and diving back in you get no absolutely and diving back in hard it's it's all so, learning experiences so what was the throw that that you did that on uh it was a samoan agi oh, okay which is, so which is where you go to your back you're facing your opponent you go to your back and you put your foot in their like hip area or stomach and you uh, have both hands on their gi and you throw them over you, like behind you and they flip. Yeah. It's like you're doing a, um, a backwards roll. Exactly. You carry them kicking over the, the person you, over you. Yeah, over the top of you with your foot and give them a little pop. And yeah. right when I pushed up, my groin popped. So on that little, on that little pop that you give with your foot, that's when your groin went, huh? Yeah, and the, the worst part was I hit like five of them before that in practice. So were you practicing Tomonagi or did you were you actually hitting that in Randori? No, I was actually hitting it, you know, in Randori. So it's oh. I hit them I hit it a bunch of times in Randori and then just one time it just was the wrong motion and Dude, that's awesome. Just, that's how quickly things can, you know, stop for you. Yeah, yeah. I just impressed all part of the journey like Tomonagi and Randori with anybody to be i mean that's not a to me that wouldn't be a high value throw i wouldn't i wouldn't uh i wouldn't get that one a lot because i just think that it's uh uh your, your timing has to be so on for somebody not to stuff that so you've no, just absolutely. told me how really good you are <laughs> yeah. no man. uh yeah only. That's, that's great that's it's great. not about you know it's i always tell people too it's not about like how long you do something it's about what you put into like the time you do do yeah. it. You know, it's like, I know people that go to the gym for five hours and don't have any, like it, they barely get anything done. And I know people that work out in their backyards for 40 minutes and do more than that person could ever dream of for you. that day. Yeah. I hear you. That's true. Well, that's a bummer that, 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 that you, uh, that you um, pulled your groin like that. Do you think that you'll, uh, you feel like you've recovered well enough to where you're going to be able to move on? It's not going to stop you. Well, that's the thing. It, it's it's pretty much put a halt at this game yeah. for the for the uh, Tokyo. But it was, uh, it, you know, I went through like pretty dark spell for like a week, probably just pretty mm -hmm. upset and pretty down about it. And then just realized, you know, there's so much other stuff going on that I have to focus on and stay positive through this whole thing. And it's all part of the journey. And I'm still young. I'm only 26. And next olympics i'll be 28 so like it's perfect timing and it's only my first run which is crazy you know and mm -hmm. i've made it to 20 like at one point i was 21st in the world i think currently i'm like 23rd or something and it's just you know it's a huge bummer to be that close and i, I it feels like in times of my life like you want something so bad and you have these goals and you always make it so close and then you're like a little you just miss it, but it's like your goals were so extremely high that it's like you did so good to fall short of that goal. You know what I mean? It's the same attitude that 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 causes you to be so disappointed for that period of time is the same is the, the same attitude that causes you to push that hard to get to wherever it is that you make it to. You know, to twenty third, to twenty first, all those places in the first place. Exactly. So there's nothing. You know, I I always. You, you think about that and you go like, oh, well, you know, you shouldn't be disappointed. You can say all this kind of stuff, but I disagree with that. I mean, I, I, no, it I, it sucks. It's it, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the reality of it is like, that's what I mean. People try to brush it off. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. You're, you're, it'll be okay. Like you'll yeah. be fine. And it's like, yeah, I know I'll be fine, but right now, no, right now like, this sucks, sucks dude. No like, fun. do you know how much hours I put in this, how much yeah. sacrifice, how much money, how much, like all my, like blood sweat and tears like yeah. how much i've cried over this how much i've like put into this how much you know it's like you you'll never understand and i don't expect you to ever understand like yeah. it, it's like unless you do it you won't you know it's like yeah 
it's it's hard to even talk about it with some people you know it's, it's you know what it's like they're right and you will get over it but yeah, right no, now, absolutely. it's just awful like give yeah. me give me my moment where i could just it, feel bad. It, let me be upset for a minute let's <laughs> for a little bit suck. i'll get over it i'll start training again yeah. there'll be another tournament but today exactly this happened <laughs> today i'm like laying here and i'm gonna eat ice cream or something like i don't know but that's okay you know yeah, yeah. tomorrow i'm making my bed and i'm getting up yeah and you can you're gonna start and that's Right. You talk about metaphors for life. Well, that's what that's what judo is all about. Right. Like you hit that mat and you get back up and you do it again. But you know what? I don't care how good your Randori is. I mean, I mean, I don't have, uh, care how good your Ukimi is. Ukimi is your falling. Right. For, for you listeners. Mm -hmm. it, somebody can still slam you hard on that mat. But you know what? It hurts. You get up. You go again. But when you hit oh, the yes. mat, it's going to hurt. You know, especially when you train on wrestling mats. I'll tell you, that gets hard. Yeah, I bet the the hard oh. rubber mats. Yeah, instead of uh, judo, most judo uh, dojos have <laughs> have like nice soft mats. Uh, yeah. These these tatamis they're called, and wrestling mats are a lot harder. So you sometimes I have to train at a gym with wrestling mats. Yeah. It can be pretty brutal, but it's a great. It's one of my favorite places to train. So it's like a double edged sword. Yep, that's good. Well, hey, listen. It, it's been it's been great talking to you. Is there anything else that uh, that you think the world should know about you, about um, you know, about training the way that you do and being successful, especially for somebody who's blind? Before we before we go, yeah, I think just uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been awesome talking to you. And yeah, you too, man. I think uh, you know the only thing I try to tell people is like the only disability is a bad attitude in life you know, don't sit around and feel sorry for yourself and, and wish you were in a better position. It's like, just the first step is to make your bed and, and get on with your day and, and start to make a better position for yourself. And also, you know, just whatever it is, you don't have to do anything crazy. Like I'm not telling everyone to go out and do grappling and stuff, like whatever you're doing in your life, just, uh, you know, do it, put your all into it and like have fun but work hard and, you know, good things will come. And there's always going to be discouraging times. There's always like scary times. There's always dark periods, but so you're always going to get through them if you keep pushing and, you know, create a support team around you and always reach out and ask for help when you need it. And if you ever need to reach out to me, you can find all my stuff at asfvision.com and you can always send me a message and I'll always do my absolute best to get back to you as soon as I can. And I usually do pretty quickly. So thank you so much for having me, Mark. I really appreciate you bet. it. And I'll, um, I'll have you send me all that information. So we'll post all those links and stuff in the, in the show notes and everything. So give me whatever awesome. you want people to have. If you have websites, uh, all that stuff, we'll make sure it gets up there. You, you said something and I want to make sure I got this right, because this is like a, this, this like needs to go on a t-shirt <laughs> or something. Um, it's you said out. the only disability is a bad attitude. Did I capture yeah. that right? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, shirts, I think that's the a shirts great, are coming soon. I think that that's a that's right. Copyright, <laughs> Anthony Ferraro. Uh, <laughs> I think that that's that's brilliant. I mean, that just sums it right up. The only the only true disability is a bad is a bad attitude. And yeah, uh, you know, I know people like I know people with no arms and no legs, and you would think like, oh, well, you know, that sucks for them, and it it does suck. Being blind sucks. You know, like all. All these things suck, but like they make the most of their life. Like I know these people that have no limbs going out and literally making ways to climb mountains and stuff, Legit, like literally climbing mountains. And it's like, I know people at home with no physical disability that are just feeling sorry for themselves and right. refusing to like do something with their lives or just like, you know, get outside or do something. And it's like, who has the disability at the end of the day? You know, it's did an interview with this this guy that calls himself wheels and he's he's in a wheelchair and this guy hits the skate parks and wait is his name hot wheels no uh i don't know no. that i've heard him called hot wheels he just calls himself wheels and he he does all anything that a skateboarder or a bmx biker would do he does in the skate parks and then he does these big big like mega jumps uh, so he's taken being in a wheelchair just like just like you've you know you've you've found your your sport that resonates with you 
for him being in a wheelchair enables him to do all that stuff. And he's, he's, uh, uh, does all this cool stuff and has, you know, all these, these videos and, and does these wow, shows and all this. That's awesome. Yeah. All this stuff. And so what you say is really true, you know, it's just, yeah, no, I, I also have a huge passion of skateboarding myself. I, I grew up in a small beach town. So like skateboarding and surfing, I, do, I do you all skateboard the time. Is, is it blind? Yeah. Blind? Yeah. Skateboard and surf. I have videos up on like my, uh, I got to check that out and stuff like that. So, and so Instagram. Anthony, no joke. If you, if, I, I'm up in Exeter, New Hampshire. Oh, uh, no way. Yeah. So if you ever, if you ever travel up this way, my son and I are big skateboarders. I'd love to hit some skate parks with you. And I'd love to bring you, especially into my dojo to teach. I, I teach um, a couple of different classes, adults and teens. Um, and a oh, lots man. of times I blindfold the teams, teens and make them not just do their martial arts, but also, you know, clean up and all that kind of stuff without the benefit of sight. And um, to have you come in and, and teach those guys uh, something would be an honor for, for all of us. So if you're ever- Oh man, that's area, incredible. I, I would love that. And it would be an honor to skate with you and your son. That would, that would be fantastic. And I'll tell you what, we can, I know a lot of dojos around here, so we could even put a little tour for you together. You can uh, that sounds great. I, I actually go up that way quite a bit, so we might have to make something happen All later. Right. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll be in touch with you more. All right, definitely. I'll, I'll pop you an email and I need to get your information anyway, so that everybody can uh, get a hold of you that, that wants to get a hold of awesome. you and, and look at your videos and your, um, um, you know, all, all the stuff that you have posted, we'll get all that up for them. So sounds great. Well, thank you, Anthony. Absolute honor talking to you. You're, you're uh, an inspiration to me as a martial artist, um, a human being. I really appreciate you sharing with us today and um, you've got some great insight. So uh, thank, thank you. Very Mark. All right. This is Mark Miller thanking Anthony and reminding you to keep it accessible. This podcast has been brought to you by TPGI, the experts in digital accessibility. Stay tuned for more Real People, Real Stories podcasts coming soon.